All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna get, get started. Uh, just actually, just a quick question before I get started. I'm I'm just curious. Um, how many of you are from the Bay Area? Like just traveling here locally. Okay, most people. Um, and raise your hand if you're uh, not from the Bay Area but from somewhere else in the U.S. Okay, that's that's interesting. I feel like we have some overlap there, but that's. Uh, um, <laughs> And then how many people are traveling from, uh, from somewhere other than the US? OK, a few. Um, great, yeah, I mean, the, the reason I ask is just my, like one of my favorite parts of doing these workshops is just um, you know, meeting a broad variety of people working in the machine learning space and just kind of trying to get a sense of you know, what problems you're excited about, what challenges you're facing. Um, it's just always really interesting to me to see uh, kind of how broad the reach of machine learning has gotten. Um, so I'm really looking forward to uh, to talking to many of you about that. And I encourage you all to, um, you know, to chat with your fellow classmates as well. Um, super interesting. OK, um, two things I want to talk about today. The first is I want to just um, kind of stepping back and looking at the whole course. I want to talk about our framework for how we think about understanding the life cycle of machine learning projects. And um, you know, coincidentally, it, this kind of maps to the schedule for the course. Um, and then once we've gone through that, I want to talk about the first part of that framework, which is really the best practices for how to set up machine learning projects. So how to choose what to work on, et cetera. And throughout this lecture, I'm going to keep coming back to this case study. And the case study is pose estimation. OK, so the problem here is we take an image of some objects, um, like the ones you see on the left. And the goal is to train a model that estimates the position of those objects and their orientation. And why might we want to do this? Um, well, you know, let's say that we're a hypothetical company called Full Stack Robotics. Um, and the reason that we want to trade a pose estimation model is because our goal as a company is to do grasping. And so the pose estimation model on the left is going to output um, the poses of the objects, which are going to be fed into a grasping model. And that grasping model is going to output motor commands to our robot. Um, so hopefully the robot can grasp the object like on the bottom. And this is kind of loosely based on a project that I worked on at OpenAI um, a year or so ago. OK, but before we dive into the specifics of that, um, I'm going to talk um, about the framework that we're going to keep using throughout this course. So here's how we think about life cycle of a machine learning project. Um, we start in kind of the planning and project uh, setup phase. And so for full stack robotics, this would be things like you know, deciding that we need to work on pose estimation at all, and then you know, figuring out what the goals of the pose estimation project are, determining what resources we need, and making sure that we have resources um, uh, set up for the project. And this is most of what I'll focus on in this lecture. Once we've planned the project, then we kind of move into the data collection and labeling phase. And so for full stack robotics, this would be things like you know, figuring out which objects we want to train our model on, collecting them, setting up the sensors that we need, um, capturing the images, and then somehow figuring out how to label those images with ground truth. One thing to note here is that I don't really think of the life cycle of a machine learning project as, as this linear flow, right? It actually feeds back to itself. So you know, in the data collection phase, we might learn some things that cause us to go back to the planning phase. So for example, we might realize, hey, actually, it's like way too hard to get data um, to, uh, for, the, for this problem. Or maybe it's too hard to annotate. And so we might go back to the planning phase and, and revisit what our goals for the project are. Once we've collected some data, then typically we'll move into the training and debugging phase. And I think this is kind of what most people think of when they think of machine learning projects. Um, so this is, um, but there are actually some things here that um, I think are outside of the scope of what you would normally learn in, in a deep learning class. Um, because there are other really important things to make sure that training your model works well. So this also includes things like, you know, maybe you want to just implement a really simple open CV baseline before you start training a deep neural network. Um, this also involves like reading papers and figuring out what people are doing here and trying to re reproduce state of the art on you know, maybe some publicly available data set. And then it also includes, um, critically, a ton of time spent um, not actually implementing models, but debugging. And we'll talk about that in, in detail tomorrow morning. And so the training phase can loop back to the other phases. So for example, we might realize that we're overfitting, and so we need to go back and collect more data, or that we might realize that our labels are unreliable. And we might actually go all the way back to the planning phase. So we, we might realize that this task is just too hard. There's no way for us to, to meet our requirements, and so we need to actually figure out 
a different goal or a different way of approaching this problem. And then finally, once we've trained a model that we're happy with, we'll deploy it. And so for full stack robotics, this could start with, you know, not actually deploying it in the real world, but deploying it in, in a controlled setting in a lab. And then we might write some tests once we're happy with how it's working to make sure that it doesn't regress. And then finally, we might try to roll it out into production. And so from here, you know, we might realize actually it worked on our training set and our validation set, but it doesn't work in the real world. And so we need to go back and uh, revisit training and data collection. And it might actually turn out, and, and this is kind of pretty common, I think, that you know, maybe the metric that we picked for this project, like maybe our, our goal of um, having a certain accuracy in estimating the pose was not actually the metric that we care about. Um, like maybe we realized that actually um, making this thing run in real time is super important, and we didn't realize that in, um, in our original planning, and so we need to go back and revisit our assumptions. Okay, so this is kind of like, I would think about this as things that happen every project, right? You plan the projects and then you, um, you end by deploying it. But there's also some things that happen more at an organizational level that are um, important to think about as well. And that includes team and hiring and infrastructure and tooling. And we'll talk about both of these things as well. Okay, actually, any questions about this as a way of thinking about machine learning projects before I move on? All right, um, so one question is like, is this comprehensive, right? If you know all of these things, is that enough to, um, to successfully deploy machine learning projects? I think there's kind of one thing missing from this, and that's you really need to understand the state of the art in your domain. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is just when you're planning projects, it's really hard to know um, in machine learning what's actually possible to do. Like what are the hard problems and what are the easy problems? Um, so it's important to kind of understand the, the literature in your, in your space in order to make good um, estimates of that. And then also I think it's super valuable for figuring out what to try next. And so we can't actually go into in, in depth in every single domain in this class, but um, Peter's lecture tomorrow afternoon on research areas is kind of um, one way of uh, hopefully a lens into what are some of the most promising um, areas that are moving fast right now. Okay, and so you know, this is kind of, that's like the abstract framework. Each of those things have more detailed steps that we'll talk through over the next couple of days. Um, today I'm gonna be focusing just on this planning and project setup phase. Are there any other questions on, um, on what I've talked about so far? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question. So the question is, you know, we have um, typically in machine learning, we train on a training set, and then we evaluate that model on a validation set. Um, and so how is that different than, you know, what I talked about here with testing? Um, and I think evaluating the performance of the model is on a validation set is one form, form of testing, but there are a lot of other types of testing that are important for, um, for making sure that your entire project goes well. And so these are things like, you know, preventing regressions in your code base. So making sure that you can um, train your model for a single step and it still works. Making sure that if you, you know, train your entire model on a smaller version of your data set, you can achieve a certain loss. Um, so there's like these code base sanity metrics. Um, but then there are also things that you might care about, like, um, for example, maybe your validation set has tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images, but you don't actually care about all those images equally, right? Like maybe there's some images where, um, you know, it's just really, really critical that you don't make a mistake on this particular type of image. So you could have tests around that. Um, so those are a couple of other examples of tests that you might have in addition to validation score. And um, Sergey will talk more about this over the next couple of days as well. Yeah. So would you then take some of that and like re-add it back to the data collection if you know like these are more important? Um, like let's say these images are more important. Would you like double like the number of those types of images in your model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, if you have some types of images that you know are important, would you just go and collect more data like that? Um, I would say I largely agree with that, but um, usually when I think of you know, uh, picking certain images to go collect more data from, um, I think the place where that's most helpful is where you find certain types of, um, of errors that you see frequently in your data set. So 
let's say that you're building a self-driving car and you realize that your vision model works really badly on kangaroos. Right? Like, how do you deal with that? Right? So one way that you could deal with that is you can just go collect a bunch of um, data of you know, cars that see kangaroos. I, I don't know. Don't ask me how to actually collect that data set. It seems really hard. <laughs> um, but that's like an abstract approach that you could take. Um, I think for these important examples, there's a distinction where like, maybe your model is actually performing really well there. Um, but it's also super, super critical that it always performs well there. And um, one of the challenging things about machine learning is that these models are um, kind of black boxes. And so if you make some change that seems like it makes the model better, um, there's always a possibility that it might, um, even though the validation score went down um, or the validation score improved, you might still have gotten worse on a few particular examples that you care about. So you know, maybe it's like um, you really, really care about making sure that you can detect like this one weird type of, um, of stop sign that you know, is that only occurs on like one street, right? Um, and your validation score wouldn't reflect that. Yes? Yes, I agree that it's, it's important not to, um, to compute your test score too often because you can overfit to that. Yeah? So going back to the previous question, right? Where does, does active learning fit somewhere in here? Like is, is, is the process of looking at um, data or, or uh, domains that your model is not performing well and then mm -hmm. taking data to augment that, is that a manual process or what is the value of setting up a pipeline that yeah. Um, so the question is, you know, often what people do is they look at examples where their model doesn't perform well, and then either in an automated way or in a manual way, they go back to data collection and they try to find more examples that look like that and put them back into the data set. Um, and you know, the answer is, I think in most cases, this happens um, relatively manually. There are exceptions. Um, in some industries, like um, you know, in social media, for example, it's much easier to collect any type of training data that you want. Um, and so it might be, it's, it's easier to automate it. But, um, and I think like the autonomous vehicle companies are also trying to figure out ways to automate it. But um, more often than not, I see people do this manually. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can you um, make your data set like sort of one big blob of data, and then for every epoch, let's say, you resample which parts are training, validation, and test? Um, I think that'll lead to overfitting on your test set as well. It's kind of related to this idea of, um, of k-fold cross-validation from more traditional machine learning. Um, but I think the, the intuition here is that um, anytime you evaluate your model on testing data in any way whatsoever, and you use that evaluation as a way of making improvements to your model, whether that's you know, through gradient descent or whether that's just through um, you know, um, a manual process of selecting models that perform better on that set, then if you do that enough times, it can lead to overfitting. Um, and so I think like, the most principled way to do this is to have a test set that you evaluate on very infrequently. Um, you do need to evaluate it on it sometimes because um, otherwise you'll overfit to your validation set. And, um, and then you just need to periodically recollect um, data from your test set, for your test set. Okay, other questions? Yeah? Do they explore, at which phase of the project do they explore the domain knowledge, actually? We are talking about the, in this latest test, right? So it was it during the planning of the project? Because you, you talked about various examples, like autonomous cars. Mm -hmm. If it is a tra traditional uh, image classification, there's not much domain, but especially in case of 
varying on the, depending on the data, you need to have one of domain knowledge, right? Sure, yeah, so the question is, at which stages of, of this do you exploit domain knowledge? And I think the answer is all of them. So in planning and project setup, domain knowledge is super critical for figuring out like, is this a reasonable goal to set it all? Um, in data collection and labeling, um, it requires some experience to figure out like, okay, what is the exact data set that we're gonna need? What is that gonna look like? And then in training and debugging, um, it's really helpful for picking what types of models to use and um, figuring out and debugging when things go wrong. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna move on to the next part of the lecture. Um, so wh what I'm gonna talk about is, you know, um, we're, we're in this project um, planning and setup phase. And so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is how to think about you know, picking projects and choosing goals for those projects. And then I'm gonna talk about metrics, um, which is kind of the single number that we use to evaluate how well our model is doing um, against our broader objective. And then I'll talk about choosing baselines. And baselines are kind of a way of telling us on an absolute level, um, or on a, on a relative level rather, how well our model is doing. So instead of just being an abstract number, how well it's doing relative to some baseline. Okay, so starting with prioritizing projects, a um, couple of key points I wanna cover here. Um, the first is how to think about finding high impact machine learning pro uh, problems. I think this is really hard, but I do wanna cover a couple of um, frameworks that I think are useful for thinking about this. Um, one is thinking about automating complex parts of your pipeline. And another is thinking about where places where cheap prediction can be valuable. And the other thing I wanna talk about is assessing the cost of machine learning projects. So the other part of deciding which project is important or which project to choose. And um, here I think the key point is that, you know, I, I think this will be unsurprising to everyone, but data availability is kind of the main um, driver of cost for machine learning projects in general but um, your accuracy requirement also plays a huge role. Okay, so you know, we're thinking about prioritizing, prioritizing projects. Um, here's a framework that I like for you know, just abstractly thinking about prioritizing projects. This is not specific to machine learning, but you know, in general, if you, wanna, if you wanna figure out what project to work on next, one way to do it is to you know, think about the feasibility on one axis and then the impact, the potential impact of the project on the other axis. And you wanna pick projects that are feasible so, you know, for example, they're not going to be too expensive, and the potential for impact is very high. Um, so the reason I talk about this is because I want to break this down into um, and look at impact and feasibility in the specific case of machine learning projects. So starting with impact, what are some mental models you can use for finding high-impact machine learning projects? And, you know, again, these are taking advantage of cheap prediction and automating complicated manual software pipelines. Um, and I'll talk about each of these. So um, I think the first case study that I, that I really like is this book called The Economics of AI. Um, and the thesis of this book is that really the core thing that AI, uh, modern AI allows us to do is reduce the cost of prediction, right? So before, in order to you know, predict where the stock market is going, you needed to pay someone a um, very high salary to look at the data themselves and run some analyses. Um, in principle, if you have really good AI, then the, the, the marginal cost of that prediction becomes zero. Um, since prediction is central for decision making, the implication of having cheap prediction means that it's, they're gonna, prediction is gonna be present in way more places than it was before. Like, um, you know, most people can't afford to hire a driver, but self-driving cars, um, in principle, could be very cheap. And um, yeah, so even in problems where it's expensive. Um, and so I think if you, if you try to take this lens of looking at the, the, um, what machine learning does and apply it to the problem of pro uh, project selection, um, I think the, the implication is to look for projects where cheap prediction um, could have a very large business impact. Another mental model I wanna cover, um, I, I like this tweet as a way of capturing it from Andre. So gradient descent can write better code than you. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's just true. Um, and so let's unpack that a little bit. Um, so this is, a, this is an idea that, um, that, that Andre has been calling software 2.0. And the idea is really, um, you know, there's, there's this existing paradigm which Andre calls software 1.0, which is like what you think of as traditional programs. So, you write explicit instructions in Python, you compile them into machine instructions, and then you run them. Software 2.0 is a 
different programming paradigm where instead of humans specifying the instructions, humans specify abstract goals. And then you have a program that searches um, for the code that best solves that problem. And so you know, if the tool of 1.0 programmers is Python, then the tool of 2.0 program programmers is not actually TensorFlow, but it's, it's really data sets. Right? So data sets are, um, are how you specify the goal that you want your, your system to solve. And so you know, why might we want to do this? Well, you know, gradient descent can write better code than you. It just works better um, often if for many problems. And it's also, in some sense, more general, because you can apply the same framework to any problem. And there are computational advantages, right? Because um, every program looks like a neural network. And so we can um, optimize hardware that works really well for those programs. And so you know, if, if, you, if you take this lens of looking at project selection, the implication is look for parts of your pipeline um, that already exist that are super complicated and where humans write a lot of rules. And then see if gradient descent can write better rules than them. Um, OK, so the other, the other driver here is, um, is feasibility. So how do we figure out how expensive a machine learning project is going to be? And I think the, the three main drivers of cost of machine learning projects are how available is data, um, how accurate do you, do you need the system to be, and then how difficult is the problem overall. Um, and so the main things to think about here for data availability is you know, how hard is it to get data in the first place, but also how expensive is it to label? You know, some, if you need um, expensive experts, it's going to be more expensive to label. If you can get labels automatically, it's going to be very cheap. And then just how much data will you need overall? You know, for some problems, you can do well with tens of thousands of examples. Um, for other problems, you might need hundreds of millions. For the accuracy requirement, um, I think there's, there's a few things that, um, that influence this. Um, one is how costly wrong predictions are. Right? So if you make a wrong prediction in a self-driving car, you might um, kill someone. Um, but if you make a wrong prediction in a recommendation system, then probably nothing really bad is actually going to happen. Um, and then the other consideration here is how often does it need to be right to be useful? Right? So for, um, for Alexa, if it, if it doesn't work at least 90% of the time, for me at least, it's super frustrating. Right? It's like not useful to me if it doesn't work 90% of the time. Um, but maybe if, um, but maybe like Netflix's um, recommendation system, if it works half of the time, I'm I'm pretty happy with it. And then you know problem difficulty, a couple ways of ways to assess this. You know how good is the public published work on similar problems? Um, and then for that published work, does it require a ton of compute to train, and does it require um, a ton of compute to deploy? And so if you think about those things, then you can get a sense of how hard is this problem from a technical standpoint. Yeah, question in the back. Uh, it's a great question. How do you know how much data you will need? Um, I don't think that there's really one answer to that to that question. Um, I think like the way I would probably approach this is um, I would I would look I would try to find the most similar problems that people have worked on um, in published work, and I would look at how much data that they needed. Um, there's a couple of rules of thumb that I that I use. I think like generally um, very infrequently see deep learning systems. Um, work well with less than 10,000 examples. There are exceptions to that, but kind of a rule of thumb. And then um, for vision systems, I think things start to like really work well when you get in the hundreds of thousands of examples. Yeah? Is there a rule of thumb uh, about how many uh, observations you need related to how many parameters your model will have? Um, is there a rule of thumb about how many observations you need and how that relates to the number of parameters in the model? Um, I think, I mean, the, there is a rule of thumb, which is you know, if, you, if you increase the number of parameters in your model, generally you need more data. Um, in practice, that's not actually always true. Um, and I don't think there's a way of like, looking at the number of parameters in your model, and um, for deep learning models at least, and then using that as a way of implying um, how many data points you need. And even if there was, I don't think it would really be useful, because the number of parameters in your model is actually like a design choice. Um, and so your goal is to, um, is to build a model that performs well on a certain problem, and you get to choose how many parameters go in your model. Yeah, question in the middle here. Yeah. When you say compute available for deployment, um, do you mean like how much compute you need to be able to run it live? Exactly, yeah. So when I say compute available for deployment, um, to unpack that a little bit, you know, 
for some applications, it might be OK to, um, to run your system on a TPU pod in the cloud, right? And just use, like, t throw tons of compute at the problem at inference time. And for other problems, you actually really need it to run on the person's smartphone live. Um, and so I, like, the way I would assess this is I would look at you know, what's, our, what's the approach that we're going to take. Um, you know, maybe someone published a paper using this huge ResNet model. And, um, and then I would look at the compute that we have available in our system. And so maybe it's like my iPhone. And then I would look at, the, look at those things and see how big the delta is. Yes? Feasibility of reinforcement learning projects. Um, they're harder. Yeah. Um, yeah, hard. I, this, is, this is more in the context of, um, of supervised learning, because that's more typically what's been deployed in practice right now. And we're um, not going to focus so much on RL in, in this workshop. How about unsupervised? Um, I, again, unsupervised is kind of more in the ongoing research side of things. Question here, yeah. Yeah, this is a great question. So, you know, often what you see is people take a model that was trained on some other data set, and then instead of just starting over, they just retrain it on um, on their data set. And the question is, like, which you know, how should you think about whether to to do that or not? Um, and the answer is, I think, like, generally, um, you know, if there's if if there is a model that's trained on a relatively similar data set to yours and you have limited data available, then it's almost always a good idea to, to try um, using a pre-trained model. So like for example, you know, in computer vision, um, almost no matter what your task is, it's, it might be a good idea to start with a, a model that's pre-trained on ImageNet. Um, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow. Question here, yeah. There's a question regarding the cost of the wrong predictions, right? Mm -hmm. So in practice, do we go for, these are all the predictive models. So do we recommend doing the deterministic approaches in those cases to avoid the cost of the wrong predictions? So it, my question is more like 99% accurate, 99.5 accuracy is still accurate, but the 0.5% of inaccuracy cost can be really high. Yeah, um, it's a great question. Yeah. yeah. So in that case, is, do, we, do we recommend to have a deterministic bonding? These are all from the models, right? So, so not, not sure I understood the last part of the question. Yeah, yeah, the question is trying to say, these are all prediction-based models that we're talking about, the MR based or VR based. Mm -hmm. So do we train any rules outside these models to avoid this kind of cost of the wrong predictions? Mm. Yeah, so the question is like, is there any way of, um, of setting up rules around the model, like some structure around the model to avoid the model making wrong predictions? Um, the answer is like, yes, that's a good idea. Um, you can use the confidence of the model, for example. If the model is not very confident, then maybe you um, don't let it make a prediction at all. Um, but with the caveat that um, I, I think this is like still a pretty hard problem in machine learning. Um, often, uh, models don't actually know where they're wrong. Um, and you know, adversarial examples are one example of that. Um, but there's also been some research that suggests that if you train one model um, on some data set like MNIST, and then you evaluate it on a very different data set, the model will make very confident wrong predictions on that data set. Um, so I think this is still somewhat of an unsolved problem. Um, I'm actually going to, I see there are more questions. I'm going I'm to move on um, for, the, for the sake of time. So I want to zoom in a little bit on this accuracy requirement and just kind of explain why I think this is so important. Um, so this is a chart showing um, the required accuracy of your projects on the x-axis and the project cost on the y-axis. And the, the key point here is that like, machine learning projects tend to scale you know, more than linearly in the accuracy requirement. So like, um, you know, a, a heuristic that you can use is if you needed to add another 9 to the, your required accuracy, that could increase the cost of your project by like a factor of 10 or something like that. Um, and so you know, if, if you need many, many 9s of accuracy in order to be successful, your project is going to be very expensive. And uh, you know, the, the key example here, I think, is self-driving cars. So there's one thing that you can do, um, I think, to reduce the need for accuracy, and that's, um, and that's product design. So you know, for example, like when I put a picture on Facebook, um, it doesn't just tag me automatically. right? The accuracy requirement would that, for that would be really high, because if it tagged me wrong, I would be very offended by that. Um, 
But you know, if it just makes a suggestion, you know, do you want to tag yourself, then it's kind of OK if that's wrong. Um, this is a product called Grammarly. And Grammarly, I think, takes this one step forward, which is it doesn't only make suggestions, but it also gives you an explanation for why those suggestions are what is suggested. And, and so that, I think, even further um, reduces the need for accuracy, because you don't need to trust the system's recommendation as much. Um, and then Netflix does something similar, right? It says, we're recommending this to you because um, you did you know, uh, something like this. And um, we don't really have time to go into this idea in that much detail. Um, I think Jeremy will talk about some similar ideas tomorrow. And um, this is a blog post that I recommend um, if you want to read more about this. So there's one other heuristic for assess assessing the feasibility of machine learning projects that I want to mention. Um, and this is um, an idea that many of you have probably seen from Andrew Ng that you know, pretty much anything that a normal person can do in under a second, we can now automate with AI. Um, so I actually don't fully agree with this, uh, but I think it's important to talk about it because it's something that you'll see. Um, uh, you know, there, there are some examples of where, where this, tr this is largely true, right? So recognizing the content of images, understanding speech, translating speech, even grasping objects, these are all things that this is kind of a plausible claim, if maybe a bit of a stretch. Um, but I think there are also a lot of counterexamples. Actually, like, does anyone have anything that they think is a good counterexample for, for this claim? Assessing someone's character, yeah, that's great. Like, I don't think we know how to train a model to assess someone's character, but um, humans definitely do that, can do that in under one second. Yeah, in the back. Uh, I didn't hear you, sorry. Detecting negation in a sentence. Um, that might also, that might actually be possible to do with, with, um, with modern language models, yeah. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Falling in love, yeah. Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't think anyone's really proved whether you can do that in less than one second. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to count that one. Yeah. Matching two people. Yeah. Um, the, that, that, that could be a good example. Um, some others I thought of are understanding humor and sarcasm. This is really easy for, um, for many of us. Uh, um, probably not all of us, but many of us. And, um, but it's ex extremely hard to do for computers still. Um, in-hand robotic manipulation, so like um, you know, being able to move my phone around in my hand. Um, we've made a lot of progress on this at OpenAI in the last year or so, but this is still a very hard problem. Um, generalizing to new scenarios, um, you know, you've never seen um, you've you've never seen me give a talk before, probably, but you kind of know how to how to react to that in some sense. And uh, a system that has never been trained on me giving a talk before wouldn't know what to do. Um, and I think there are many others. So, you know, again, I wanted to point this out because it's something you'll see, but um, I don't think this is actually a very good heuristic for assessing feasibility. Okay, so let's, let's come back to our, um, our ongoing example of full stack robotics. And so let's talk about why we decided to focus on pose estimation. Um, so again, we have these two levers, impact and feasibility. Let's start with impact. Um, you know, our company's goal is grasping. And in order to do that well, we really need reliable pose estimation. So this is going to be hugely impactful. And the traditional robotics pipeline that we use um, with hand design heuristics, um, it's uh, slow and it's brittle. Um, and so this might be a great candidate for software 2.0. So is this, is this feasible, right? So like, let's, let's look at data availability. Um, super easy to go collect a bunch of data to use for this task. But labeling it could be a challenge. So that's something to keep an eye on. And then how accurate do we, do we need this to be? Um, well, we think we actually need really high accuracy to grasp an object. Um, but the cost of failure is quite low, right? Because our goal is actually to, let's say, move objects from one bin to another. And so the thing that we really care about is not the percentage of time that we grasp the object correctly, but the number of objects that we can move from one bin to another in an hour. Um, so maybe we actually don't really need, uh, like, if, if we fail, it's not that big a deal. And how hard is the problem? Um, Pretty similar to published results, but you know, we'll have to adapt it to our data set, so it seems feasible. OK, just to review, um, the key points here are to look for high impact machine learning projects. You know, there's two heuristics that I like. Um, look for complex parts of your pipeline that are good candidates for software 2.0. And um, look for places where cheap prediction might be valuable. 
And then to assess the cost, um, really the main, things you need, the main thing you need to look at is data availability, but your accuracy requirement also plays a huge role. OK, the, the next thing I want to talk about is choosing metrics. Um, and you know, just to give you a preview of what we're going to cover, um, you know, the, the main thing to realize here is that like, in most real-world machine learning projects, like in academia, you know, often you get a data set and there's a single number that you need to drive down. Um, that's the case where machine learning works super well. But in the real world, that's rarely the case. Right? Um, there's very, rarely only one thing that you care about um, improving the performance on of a project. But the reality is that machine learning systems tend to work best when, at any given time, you're trying to optimize one number. So you know, the implication of these two statements is that you need to find some way of combining your metrics. Um, and you know, since you care about multiple things and any way of combining the metrics is going to be an approximation, um, this can and will change throughout your project. Um, OK, so I want to review just a, a concept from, from classification, um, which is the ideas of accuracy, precision, and recall, because we're going to use these as examples. Um, so this chart on the left is a confusion matrix. It shows the, um, uh, it buckets your predictions into whether you predicted something as no or yes on the top, and whether the, it was actually no or yes on the bottom. And so your accuracy is just the percentage that you get correct divided by the total. So it's the sum of the diagonals over the total number of examples. So in this case, it's 50%. Um, the precision is your true, pro true positives, so the number of times that you correctly predicted um, yes, divided by the total number of times that you predicted yes. Um, and so this is a way of showing um, you know, how, uh, how, confident your, like how overconfident your system was. And then lastly, recall. Um, this shows your true positives over um, the number of times that the answer was actually yes. And so if this number is small, then this means that your system is being very conservative and it's not predicting yes frequently enough. OK, so now um, let's, let's think about why it's important to choose a single metric. So let's say that we've trained three models um, on some task, and they have the following precision and recall scores. And our goal is to figure out which one is best. right? Um, because so the, the simple reason is, like, how do, how do we actually do this with three models? Like, it's not really clear. None of these um, dominate the others. And so how might we combine metrics? Um, there's a few strategies. The simplest is just to average the, the uh, values of the metrics. And so if we do that here, um, then we see model three is the best, because it has the highest average of precision and recall. Um, that's actually not normally done for pre precision and recall. Um, uh, and we'll talk about some more uh, specific strategies. But another thing that's very common that you'll see for different types of metrics is you pick um, like n minus 1 of your metrics, and you just set a threshold for those. So you say, we're only going to consider models that are above this threshold on this metric. And then we take the last metric, and then that's the number we're actually trying to drive down. Um, so um, you know, there's, there's a few strategies for how, you, um, for how you might choose which metrics are threshold. Um, Ultimately, it really comes down to you know, the one that you should, um, the, 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 the metrics that you should choose to threshold are kind of the ones that um, are often the ones that you're already doing well on. And so you want to just make sure that you're not going to do any worse. So let's say that we do that here. Um, and maybe we choose, maybe we say that we, want our, we know that we want our model to have recall greater than 0.6. And then if it's greater than 0.6, we pick the one with the best uh, precision. And so that would lead us to pr picking model two. Um, for many domains, like precision and recall, there are domain-specific formulas that you can use. Um, and so one for, that you'll see for precision and recall is called the uh, mean average precision, or MAP. And the idea here is um, for every recall value, you can adjust the, the, how your model is uh, uh, the, the threshold that you use to pick yes or no for your model, and then that gives you a different precision score. So you can tune your precision by adjusting, your, by adjusting the recall of your model. And so this gives you a curve where you plot recall on the x-axis and precision on the y-axis. And if you compute the area under this curve, um, that's called the average precision. And then you can average your average precision over all of your classes, and it gives you a metric called mean average precision. 
And so maybe we'll compute the mean average precision um, for these three models, and we might find out that model one is best. OK, um, bringing this back to, to full stack robotics, so how do we choose a, a metric for pose estimation? And so remember that we you know, need to compute the position error and the orientation error. And then I'm also going to add um, another wrench in this, which is we might also care about the prediction time. So the way that we might go about this for our hypothetical company is we might start by enumerating what are the requirements for this system. So our downstream goal was real-time robotic grasping. And we might think that you know, to do that, we really need position error less than one centimeter. Um, we're not sure how much less, but we're pretty confident that's less. And we need a pretty accurate angular error estimation. So like maybe it has to be less than five degrees, because if the, the angle is really far off, then the robot will grasp um, the, the object the wrong way. And then finally, you know, we need to run it in real time. And our, our team might estimate that really to run this system in full time, the pose estimation model needs to run in 100 milliseconds. Yeah, question? If the object is spherical or something, how do you decide the orientation? If the object is spherical, how do you decide the orientation? Yeah, there, um, that's a great question. Um, there's, for, there's, not like, there's not a single canonical orientation for every object. Um, so you might need to do it up to some sort of um, some sort of like um, rotations of the of the system. Yeah. Yeah. So in practice, the way that we solved this was um, instead of learning a single. Um, so, the, so the, I mean, I, I think the the concern is like. Um, let's say that you have a cube, and you wrote the, rotate the cube by 90 degrees. The cube looks exactly the same. So how does the model tell the difference between those? Um, and you know, this is a simplified example here, but the way we actually solved this was instead of learning a single best estimate for the rotation of the cube, instead we learned a, um, or the rotation of the, uh, uh, instead we learned a distribution over rotations. And so it's OK if the model says it's 0, and it's OK if the model, model says it's 90. There's another question. Yeah. Uh, so then here, do you decide on, um, I guess, like the kind of pre-input data that you're going to kind of provide a guarantee that this will work well in your kind of constraints, or is that decided before you pick this? Yeah, so the question is, like, is this, you know, are, should you also be thinking about where um, what type of input data you need this to work on? Um, the answer is absolutely. I mean, I, th I think um, I um, generally I, I think about that as sort of a separate decision to the decision of like what metric we're trying to optimize. Like you might first say this is the type of data set that we need, and then you might say, um, okay, we we know that the model is going to work. We we want the model to work well on this type of data set. And then this question is really about you know when we say we want the model to work well on this type of data set. What do we mean by work well? So that's really what we're trying to do here. Um, OK, for the, for the sake of time, I'm going to move on from this. Um, so, to, um, you know, to, so we've enumerated some requirements. And now you know, we might train a few models just to see how well we're currently doing. And we might realize that we're already doing quite well in position error. Um, but our angular errors are really far off. And our inference time is too high. And so how can we use this data to make a decision about what the first metric for us to optimize is? Well, I think a reasonable choice would be, since the angular error is so far off, let's choose that as the single metric that we're going to optimize. Um, but let's threshold the position error. We don't want the position error to get worse. So we're going to throw out models that have position error greater than one centimeter. And we're also going to um, ignore runtime for now, because you know, the angular error is just so bad that we want to get that number down, and then we'll figure out how to make it run in real time later. Um, L2 loss on the, the Euler angle of the object. And uh, yeah. Um, so angular error means um, like if you have some canonical rotation of the object and then you have some prediction, predicted rotation of the object from your model, what's the L2 loss between those? 
OK, and then the what? We might use quaternions, yeah. Um, and so the last thing that we'll do here is, you know, we've chosen um, angular error. We care about more things than angular error. As our angular error gets closer to our requirement, um, then we'll revisit this metric and we'll choose something else. OK, um, the, the last thing I want to talk about is choosing baselines. Um, and the things I want to cover here are, you know, the reason that we choose baselines is really because they give us a lower bound on how well we can expect the model to perform. And so um, because it's a lower bound, the tighter that lower bound is, the more useful information it gives us. So you know, the better the baseline that we use, the more useful it's going to be to us. And so let's, let's talk a little bit more about why baselines are important. So let's say that this is your training and validation error. right? Um, and your goal is to figure out like, what's the next step um, in this project. And you have these curves. How would you figure that out? I see a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of thinking and a lot of blank faces, and I think that's the exact right reaction to have here, because um, the answer is if I just show you this chart, there's actually no way of telling what to do next, right? Um, so I'll, let me show you two different baselines. So let's say that we um, for our task we gather a human performance baseline, and let's say that human performance baseline is kind of essentially what our training error already is. Um, the implication then is, you know, now if I look at this, I say our, our training error is actually already really good. Um, but our validation error is kind of far off from our training error. And so we're overfitting to our training set, and maybe we need to go collect more data or add some regularization. But if we have a different baseline, and our human performance baseline is you know, an error closer to 20 instead of 35, then the implication here is really different, right? The implication here is that um, our model is actually really bad. Um, and so maybe, you know, maybe we need to, to figure out a better mo model architecture for this task or train for longer or something like that. So you know, if, if, we, if we accept that baselines are important, then the next question, I think, is where should we look for baselines? How do we find good baselines? Um, so there's some that are, um, that are internal to the company, like you know, what are our requirements? That could be a base, good baseline, right? Like if we, need, if we know we need this, um, this thing to be 90% accurate, then that's a reasonable baseline to use. Um, published results. So you know, um, if someone wrote a paper that says it's possible to get 90% accuracy on this task, then that's a reasonable baseline to use. Um, although it's important to make sure that it's really a fair comparison. You know, if your data is way harder than the data that they published on, then um, maybe it's not a fair comparison. And then there's some baselines also that are, you know, that, that like the machine learning team can create. Um, and so this could be things like scripted baselines. So um, maybe you write some open CV scripts just to give you some sense of how well you can do on this task. Maybe you create some rules-based methods. Um, I think like one interesting anecdote for this is um, when, when the OpenAI team started working on, um, on Dota, the first thing that they did is they had like one of the best engineers in the company spend close to two months just trying to write the best scripted Dota bot that he possibly could. Um, and the result was that they, he built a better scripted Dota bot than anyone else had ever built before, because um, he's an amazing engineer. But our machine learning system ended up beating that in like a month. Um, but it was still important enough that we like invested, that this guy invested a ton of his time into creating it. Um, because otherwise, there's just there's no way of knowing uh, like um, how well our model was really doing. Simple machine learning baselines are another are another really good thing to do. Um, so like, you know, often um, like w when I talk to people about um, how they're using machine learning to approach their problems, they say, you know, yeah, we really want to try um, you know deep learning and we want to try um, you know one shot learning and like all of these research areas, um, but like really the thing. That you know that they that they haven't tried that's super important is maybe linear regression, um, and so I think if you haven't tried linear regression, then that's like usually a good place to start, um, and you know so in other domains maybe like in in language this might be a bag of words classifier, um, uh, you might try you know you might try to hand engineer some features to use for your linear regression, um, 
or you know, if you're further along in the project or you're using fission data, um, maybe you use like a really, really simple neural network model before you go and implement the latest state of the art thing. Yes? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. The the question is, um, you know, oftentimes you see these papers from uh, from you know, not going to name any any names, but often they're from Google. <laughs> um, and you look at the you know the methods section, and they're like, yeah, we trained on you know eighteen thousand TPU cores for three months, and it costs four billion dollars to train this model. <laughs> And you're like, well, I have one GPU, so <laughs> if I do the math, like if I let this thing train for the rest of my life, I'm not sure that it would really um, reach state of the art on this problem. And so the question is, like, how do you deal with that? I think um, I don't have a great answer to this. I think um, so. Like, one question is coming back to what your goal for the project is, right? I mean, I think um, it's it's rare in practice. Like, this class is about you know building machine learning um, projects that you're going to ship into the real world, right? And so. It's rare in practice that, um, you know, that really, um, you know, reaching, like getting state of the art is actually the goal in and of itself. And so the first question you might ask is like, how well can I do with the compute available to me? And then is that good enough for solving the problem? Um, the second thing I would think about is um, oftentimes like these, like the, the fact that there's a ton of compute available is, um, is like makes some of these some of these research teams rely on it a little bit. And so often there's more efficient ways to do things um, than the way that they did it in the paper that used a million TPUs. Um, and you know, I th we've seen this, like for example, in um, uh, neural architecture search. Um, like the, the methods for that have just become so much more efficient. Um, and the last thing I would say is you can just wait, right? Because the, um, the hardware available for machine learning is becoming much, much cheaper. And so, you know, it's possible in like three years or so that a commodity GPU could be able to solve the problem. Um, okay, the, the last thing I want to talk about briefly is just um, human baselines. Um, human baselines are really good because, you know, again, the better our baseline, the more valuable it is. Um, and so humans are often really good at the tasks that we want to solve. Um, you know, uh, not all not all humans are um, are equally good at labeling data for every single machine learning task. Um, you know, generally, um, random people work less well than ensembling random people. Um, and then, for many tasks, domain experts work much better than random people, um, or you know, really really good domain experts who might be expensive. Um, and then, oftentimes, the best thing that you can do is ask many experts and combine their opinions. Um, so again, just to review here, the, the key points on choosing baselines are you know, the reason that we really care about baselines is that um, we need to know how well we can expect our model to perform. And baselines are a good way of doing that. And the tighter, the, the better that estimate of what's possible is, the more useful the baseline is going to be. And so like, the best thing to do is to go out and try to find a baseline that um, you think gives the best possible performance on this task. OK, um, any, any questions? Yeah. Um, do you use Amazon return for like, to get data? Do you sign the paperwork? Or yeah, the question is, can you use Amazon Tur uh, Turk to collect data? Um, absolutely. A lot of people do this. Um, I don't know if you need to sign any paperwork. Yeah. Can you provide an example on the 3D pose estimation, how to create a data set for it? Mm -hmm. Because that can be considered as a regression problem or a classification problem. In post CNN, they consider regression, but some people consider classification. And depending on that, your creation of data set is going to be different. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is for 3D pose estimation, can you give an example of how you might collect that data set? Um, I'll give two examples. Um, one, the, uh, both are real. One is a really bad example, and one that I think is a good example. Um, the really bad example was um, early on in my PhD, I needed to create a data set for um, a really similar task to this one. And so I spent an entire weekend um, kind of carefully moving objects on a grid so that I knew exactly where the objects were at every time. And then I would step back and take a photo 
um, and then write down you know, where the, the object was at that particular time. Um, so that's a really bad approach because it took me an entire weekend and I still didn't collect a very big data set. Um, and a better approach is um, you, know, you, you can use sensors to, um, to collect estimates of the pose of the object. So there's uh, motion capture systems that you know, are, are very accurate. Um, and so you can in instrument your objects and your environment with motion capture sensors and then automatically um, get the pose of the objects. My question was where to do it. You know, you have infinite number of scenarios that you can put your motion sensor and take a picture of that. So you don't want to create trillions of data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you do it smartly that can capture most of the scenarios? You can change the distances, you can change the angles. That's going to be infinite. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you choose which things to even collect uh, data on? And it's kind of a design question. It depends on where you want your model to perform well. And you know, generally, the best thing that you can do is collect data that looks like the data that you want to eventually evaluate your model on. Yeah? I'm wondering, uh, in the early phase of a project, how many people you should I engage? And what is the reasonable length of size of team? Uh, this is a great question. So what's a reasonable size of team for a machine learning project? Um, I think there, you know, there are teams, there are like very, very large teams working together on machine learning projects, um, you know, like hundreds of people, um, I would say. Um, I think just like any other engineering project, the like sort of organizational complexity scales very quickly as you increase the number of people working on the same project. Um, I think in machine learning, this is sometimes especially true because um, um, oftentimes it's like not really clear what will work and what won't work. Um, and so, Oftentimes, you're just kind of like trying a bunch of uh, trying a bunch of ideas that you think might work, and then waiting for something to land. And so that's that's a um, that's a an approach that doesn't scale very well to a very large number of people. Um, w the thing that we've seen be very successful at OpenAI is teams of call it around like eight to twelve people um, that have a mix of researchers um, and software engineers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Question in the back here. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, for many problems, you have different devices that you need to ultimately have your model work on, and they have different computing power. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a great answer to that. I mean, I think like, one thing that comes to mind is you just pick the, you pick the lowest level requirements, and you, you engineer to that. Um, OK, we're, we're a little bit over. Um, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up there. Um, a few quick announcements. Um, the first is around power adapters. So there are some power strips that have been floating around. The intention is to have those in the back of the room um, so that you can, you know, so everyone can have access to them and you can plug in your laptops during break. Um, you know, the reality of this room is that there's like not really enough power out outlets in the center here for everyone to have their laptop plugged in um, during the labs. So um, if you can please move the power adapters back to the back of the room and then, um, you know, share those for charging your devices, I think that's going to be the the best way for making this work well. Um, second announcement um, is about happy hour tonight. So um, it's, I think it's listed on the schedule for 30 minutes, but um, actually we're gonna, it's gonna be in the atrium over here and um, it'll run from seven to nine. Um, and there'll be kind of appetizers and, and drinks available. Um, so hopefully you can all make it to, to, to that. Um, and um, uh, so we're about to take a 30 minute break. Um, when we come back from that, um, we're going to start our first lab. And so you know, please, please bring your laptops to that section. Um, but before we go to break, um, I'm going to um, turn it over to Sergey, who's going to say a couple words of, about our first sponsor, Turnitin. Oh, I should plug in. I'll just do a couple minutes now, and then Eric is also going to do a couple minutes before next break. Okay.
Are you going to be speaking for a while now? No, or? just like a couple of minutes. Okay, just a couple of minutes. All right, so I'm just going to do a couple of minutes. Um, so Turnitin is the sponsor of this event. A lot of you have scholarships from them. Um, there's kind of two things. I'm from Gradescope. We got acquired by Turnitin, so I can speak to the AI we do at Gradescope part of things. And then Eric has been this. He's not here yet. He's going to speak before the next break for like two, two more minutes. Um, but grade scope, the basic idea is we want to have a platform where you can grade exams, homework, and code all in one platform. We got started right here at Berkeley as grad students building a tool for our own needs. We have to grade a lot of exams, and it sucks to grade on paper. So we thought we could upload the paper to uh, you know, the, the, the internet and then grade in a web application. And then when it becomes digital like that, I mean, it's not fully digitized but at least it's an image instead of just on paper, we can start applying computer vision and other AI te technologies to uh, try to speed up grading. The motivation for us is not auto grading, it's really helping the instructor. So it's like grading on paper sucks, everyone understands that. When they start grading on grade scope, it goes a little faster. Uh, but the real, I think, prize at the end of the road is for any question that a professor may want to ask, no matter how complicated, can we get to a point where they grade, let's say, 5% of all the answers to it, and then we grade the rest automatically, 100% accuracy. That's kind of the motivation, motivation for us. Um, w you know, what's in production now is called AI-assisted grading. Basically, the instructor uploads a template, says where the questions are, selects a question type for a given question, and then we form groups by reading the handwriting, clustering the answers, um, and we present the instructor with groups that they can review, and then when they grade, they grade a whole group at once instead of one, question, one answer at a time. If we're not perfect, which we're not, we also give them a user interface to correct our mistakes and also group more things that we didn't know how to group. And this is crucial, I think, in AI development. You know, you're not going to be 100% accurate. Um, you should focus on the user experience um, such that even if you're not 100% accurate, it's still a good experience and helps them. So we're big into that. We actually went through like 25,000 questions to see what kind of questions people are actually asking. Uh, this was like an annotation project that was fun. A little academic paper came out of it. Uh, people are asking all kinds of questions, a lot of multiple choice questions, fill in the blank, a lot of medium uh, kind of short answer type questions, essay questions, and drawing questions, interestingly. So our goal for us for the next year or two is to really scale our assistance to short answer questions like this and even drawing questions. And uh, we're taking a few shot learning approach to this. We actually have some cool results. Um, this is like an active few shot learning. This is essentially the system asking from right to left for the instructor to label um, a given answer. And then the accuracy increases from like one, like if it has just one labeled answer, it's only 1% accurate on this question. But after five, it's over 50% accurate. And so it's kind of cool. Um, we also have machine learning in a bunch of parts of our app. And it kind of like the iceberg is really um, you know, there's a lot under the water that you might not even realize is machine learning, but is actually, you know, using data and code together to train something that's part of the user experience. And Eric is going to talk more about the NLP side of AI that turned it in. We're, we're, we're hiring on both sides, so come talk to us. And then um, we, we have people from turned it in at the table right outside. So let's head out to break and then meet up here at 1030. Uh, let's do 1035. 1035. All right. Thank you. Thank you.